Okay, intermolecular forces. Remember inter, just like the Olympics is an international competition, a competition between nations. Inter, that prefix meaning between. Intermolecular forces are the forces between molecules. So we have different names for the different strengths and different types of attractions that can occur between molecules. The first one are called London dispersion forces. So every molecule will experience London dispersion forces simply because every molecule is made up of atoms and all atoms have protons in their nuclei and electrons in their atoms and then throughout the molecule. So what happens? Well, opposite charges attract. We know that. Certainly the protons that are in a nucleus will have attractions for the electrons that are in the atom nearby and then shared electrons between atoms within a molecule. But there will also be attractions, much weaker it's true, between the protons in one molecule and electrons in a neighboring molecule. And so the proton here can attract the electron in the neighboring molecule. Does the proton in this atom of the second molecule attract the electrons in the neighboring molecule? Sure they sure they do. Now that's a very weak attraction and so we see here that these London dispersion forces are weak. And yet, all molecules are made up of atoms, all atoms made up of protons and electrons, so we always have, we can have protons in one molecule attracting electrons in a neighboring molecule. And so this attraction right here is the LDF, or London Dispersion Force. Okay, so an example down here, I've got the boiling points of chlorine and iodine. So these are both diatomic elements. And you'll notice that the boiling point of chlorine is quite a bit lower than the boiling point of iodine. Something I didn't mention here, that the strength of the, in the London dispersion force will vary with the number of electrons. So first we're going to look at chlorine and iodine just to understand why they experience London dispersion forces. And then seeing that these boiling points are pretty different, iodine up there at 84 degrees Celsius, much higher than the chlorine boiling point. We'll see if we can explain that trend, why iodine has a much higher boiling point than the chlorine. So if you'll recall, in order to discuss the intermolecular forces, we need to draw Lewis structures and determine the molecular polarity of the molecules. So I draw the Cl2 Lewis structure, thinking of the 14 valence electrons and realize it looks like this, as well as I2 with its single covalent bond and the remaining lone pairs. Okay, so if we're examining this, these molecules for molecular polarity, then we're going to first look at the electronegativity difference. Well, without even looking up the electronegativity of chlorine, it's very clear that we're subtracting two values that are the same, and so the difference is going to be 0.00. .00. So there's definitely a nonpolar covalent bond between the two chlorine atoms. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the iodine side of things, you'll realize, yes, we're, er, we're subtracting the electronegativity of iodine from itself. That's also going to be zero, and so there'll also be nonpolar covalent bonds here or bond, a single bond. Okay, so now to determine the polarity of the molecule. Well, when there's only one bond in the molecule, that bond really does determine the overall molecular polarity. And so if there's no shift or separation of charge, if there's no shift in electron density in that bond, then the overall molecule will be nonpolar. So the fact that there's nonpolar covalent bond only, that's all that's there, means that this will be a nonpolar molecule. And we do the same analysis on the other side and realize having only nonpolar bonds present, in this case just one of them, this will be a nonpolar molecule. So we have two nonpolar molecules. Again, those atoms are made up of protons and electrons, 
and we have two chlorine atoms in the Cl2 molecule and two iodine atoms in the I2 molecule. So looking up the atomic number for chlorine at 17, we realize 17 protons in each nucleus, 17 electrons in each atom. At two chlorine atoms, the two times 17 will be 34 electrons. And so with our 34 electrons here, we're going to have London dispersion forces due to 34 electrons. On the iodine side of things, with, um, with a uh, atomic number of 54, we have 2 times 54, or 108 electrons. And so in the point that I make, whoops, And so on the point that I make here, that the strength will vary directly with the number of electrons, what I mean here is total number of electrons, not valence. This is the total number of electrons. So we've got LDF forces due to 34 electrons with Cl2 and due to 108 electrons with I2. And so the LDF due to the 108 electrons will be stronger than the London dispersion forces due to the 34 electrons. Okay, and so that explains then why it's going to take a lot more energy to separate I2 molecules from one another. Now just a reminder, the London dispersion forces that we're describing here are not this bond, this is a covalent bond, a very strong covalent bond, but London dispersion forces are an intermolecular attraction, an attraction between neighboring particles. So when we have a second iodine molecule here, we're talking about the attractive forces that exist between these two molecules. So there's your London dispersion force, the attraction between the molecules. Okay, so London dispersion forces exist between all molecules. They're relatively weak in nature, but you will see higher boiling points for nonpolar molecules that have more electrons. Okay, now considering a second type of intermolecular force, dipole-dipole forces. So dipole-dipole forces occur due to the attraction of one partially positive or partially charged end of one molecule and the attraction that that will have for the oppositely charged end of an adjacent molecule. So definitely these forces occur between polar molecules only. They're moderate in strength. This is stronger than our London dispersion force attraction. I'll just indicate them over here in this diagram. So I've made these ovals and the negative and positive ends are indicating the partially negative and positive ends of the molecules. And you'll notice that I'm showing the green attractive force, right? So this, this green attractive force here is the dipole-dipole force in the diagram. So you'll notice again that it's an attraction between particles between particles, and you'll see it's from, it's, I'm setting it up so opposite charges attract. So look at the example of HCl. Go ahead and draw the Lewis structure of HCl, and then draw a neighboring Lewis, uh, uh, the Lewis structure of a neighboring molecule, but make sure to have the partially positive end of one molecule attracting the partially negative end of the second molecule. Okay, so I've drawn two HCl molecules and using their electronegativities of hydrogen and chlorine, I'm able to determine that these polar bonds are created by the very electronegative chlorine attracting more electrons towards itself compared to the hydrogen. And so I use the partially negative and partially positive symbols to indicate the partially negative and positive ends of this molecule. There's only one bond in the molecule and so that one, the polarity of that one bond is determining the polarity of the overall molecule. And I can see in, that then the attraction will exist between the partially negative end of one molecule and the partially positive of another. 
this attraction that I've indicated in green is between the two molecules. That's, a, that's the dipole-dipole force. This force is moderate in strength, meaning stronger than a London force. But just to be very clear, it is much, 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 much weaker than the very strong covalent bond between the two atoms within a molecule. And there's our second dipole-dipole attraction. Now, will these two molecules also experience London forces? Sure they will, but we have a, a permanent dipole in these polar molecules that leads to the stronger dipole-dipole attraction. Okay, now how do you think the strength of the dipole-dipole force between HBr molecules will compare to that of HCl? I'll just remind you in the notes here that the strength of that dipole-dipole force is directly proportional to the molecular polarity. So the more polar the molecule, the stronger this dipole-dipole force is. So do some analysis now for HBr and then compare that to the HCl. The electronegativity of bromine is 3.0. Okay, and so I consider the electronegativity difference between hydrogen and chlorine at 1.0 and between hydrogen and bromine at 0.8 and realize that this bond is more polar than this bond. So when there's only one bond in the molecule, that bond determines the overall polarity of the molecule. And so this polar bond is, you know, coming in at 1.0. So this is a molecular dipole now of 1.0, whereas here I'm really at 0.8. And so the more polar the molecule, I can expect stronger dipole-dipole forces. So I would expect then that the boiling point of HCl would be higher than the boiling point of HBr. Okay, the third point, or the third type of intermolecular attraction is called hydrogen bonding. And this is a often confusing type of intermolecular attraction, I think mainly because of its name. So the term hydrogen bond probably makes you think of an atom that's bonded to hydrogen. And so looking at this water molecule, people would often expect that this bond here would be considered a hydrogen bond. They would think that water has a hydrogen bond. They probably would say water has two hydrogen bonds. But this, in fact, is completely incorrect. These two bonds here are covalent bonds. Hydrogen bonding is an intermolecular attraction, an attraction between adjacent molecules. And so in order to illustrate an intermolecular attraction, I have to draw a second water molecule. The intermolecular attraction occurs between the molecules. And so the green, what I've indicated here, is a hydrogen bond. Notice it's occurring between molecules. This is our strongest intermolecular attraction, and yet it's still not approaching the strength of the covalent bonds between the two atoms. So how do we define a hydrogen bond? Well, it's the attraction that the lone pair of electrons on this electronegative oxygen will have for the hydrogen that is directly bonded to oxygen all in this adjacent molecule. So the fact that this OH bond here is very polar means that these electrons are being held closely to the oxygen. The hydrogen nucleus then, really the proton that's in this hydrogen nucleus, is vulnerable, if you will, or easily attracted by an electronegative atom in a neighboring molecule. And that's the concept of a hydrogen bond. And so you'll see here, I've written this out, the key is that this hydrogen needs to be directly bonded to a very electronegative atom, specifically oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine. Those are the elements that when bonded to the hydrogen make this hydrogen vulnerable to a hydrogen bond strength attraction by the lone pair of electrons on a highly electronegative atom in a neighboring molecule. So remember, this is an intermolecular attraction, an attraction between the particles. It's not the covalent bond in the molecule. Okay, so now I'm asking you to draw diagrams, use your Lewis structures, and illustrate the hydrogen bonding that occurs in HF, 
So in a sample of hydrogen fluoride, show, like draw and illustrate the hydrogen bonding that occurs in that sample. And the same for ammonia, NH3. Okay, so you'll see that I drew two HF molecules and illustrated an attraction between the hydrogen in one molecule that's directly bonded to a fluorine and the, elect and the lone pair of electrons on the fluorine in a second or a neighboring molecule. Same thing here with the ammonia. There are two ammonia molecules drawn and you'll see the lone pair on one nitrogen attracting the hydrogen that is directly bonded to a nitrogen. Okay, so in summary, when you are looking to identify the intermolecular forces present, present between molecules, first draw the Lewis diagram or the Lewis structure. Determine the electronegativity difference to classify the bonds as polar or nonpolar. And then uh, look at the bond symmetry. So again, you're looking for lone pairs around the central atom. If they're present, the molecule's asymmetrical. If they're not present, make sure that all the bonded atoms are the same before you say that the molecule is symmetrical. And then classify the molecule as either being polar or nonpolar. So again, 2C here, this is about the molecule being polar or nonpolar. And then look for sites of hydrogen directly bonded to oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine, because that will be a clue later to hydrogen bonding. And finally, once you've determined the molecular polarity, determine the intermolecular forces. So the nonpolar molecules will experience LDF only, whereas polar molecules will experience LDF and dipole-dipole. And if we have the HO, HN, or HF bonds present, then that molecule has the ability to experience hydrogen bonding in addition to the LDF. Now, just a comment about hydrogen bonding. We would say that water has the capacity to form or the ability to form hydrogen bonds. We do not say that water is a hydrogen bond. Water is not a hydrogen bond. Water is a molecular compound. Water has the ability or has the capacity to form hydrogen bonds between particles. So just be careful about your wording there. I see lots of times water is a hydrogen bond. No, it's not. There is not a hydrogen bond within a water molecule. Water is a molecular compound and it has the ability or capacity to form hydrogen bonds. Okay, good luck with that.